your Bibles please and turn to 1 Kings and chapter 8, page 311 in the Church Bible, 1 Kings chapter 8, and we read from verses 54 to 61. So it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us, nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And may these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Let's pray. Lord, once again, as we turn to your holy word, we acknowledge the scriptures are indeed the abiding and living word of God. Lord, our desire is to hear your voice speaking to us once again. To that end, we pray, turn our hearts again to hear, to receive, remove from us every distraction, Remove from us every preconceived idea that would be a hindrance to us hearing the word of God. Come by your Holy Spirit and teach us, we pray again this night, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Three weeks have passed since we looked at this conclusion to Solomon's prayer. And if you didn't hear that sermon and wish to do so, you can't because it wasn't recorded. So uh, what I just thought I ought to do this evening, because of that gap of several weeks at least, just to remind you, because we are partway through this last section. Remember the situation. Solomon is bringing to a climax the end of a great piece of work that has taken seven years to complete. The building of the temple. God's dwelling place on the earth. The glory of the Lord has come down and the priests have had to flee out of the temple. Solomon is found now dedicating the temple, leading the people of God in prayer. It is a never to be forgotten occasion. Not only because of the huge numbers of animals that were sacrificed, and it is an enormous number, but the most impressive thing is Solomon the king acting as high priest, pleading publicly on behalf of the people of God. It is noteworthy that at the end of this chapter in verse 66 that he sends the people away And they bless the king and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel his people. I say it was a day not to be forgotten. The day, the events and Solomon's prayers in particular had made a lasting impression upon the people. Both Solomon's conduct and the content of his prayers 
Matthew Henry said, Never were words more fitly spoken, nor more pertinently. Never was a congregation dismissed with what was more likely to affect them and abide with them. Now before we somewhat sarcastically dismiss this and say, but oh, look what happened to Solomon in days to come. Let me remind you that Solomon departed from the Lord only at the very end of his life. And he reigned for 40 years. He began building the temple in the fourth year of his reign and he completed it after seven years. Now you can do your simple arithmetic and you realise this is happening earlier on in his reign. He remained faithful for the bulk of his life. We will look at his failings and shortcomings in due course. But we must not lightly dismiss this great prayer. It is one of the great prayers of the scriptures. And it made a lasting impression upon, Sol upon the people of God, principally because it made a great impression upon the heart and mind and conscience of Solomon. Three things were impressed upon Solomon, and they are reflected in verses 54 to 61, the section we are looking at now. He had, first of all, you may remember we said, a profound sense of of the promises of God, of God's faithfulness. There, verse 56, there has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. And then we noticed, and this is where we will dwell this evening, he had secondly an intense longing for the presence of God. And then also thirdly, a confident anticipation of what I will call the promptness of God, the readiness of God to answer prayer. But we will leave that for another occasion. We've looked at the profound sense of the promises of God that so impressed itself and gripped the mind and heart of this man Solomon as he prayed. But now we want to look secondly at the intense longing for the presence of God that is expressed in verses 57 and 58. And I want to look with you at the nature and the content of this longing. Secondly, why his longings are expressed in this particular way. And then thirdly, the, to consider with you the impression that such longings should leave on our hearts and our consciences. So first of all, let's look at verses 57 and 58 and consider the nature and content of this longing. These are not things which are expressed specifically as a prayer. He is speaking to the people of God. He is speaking in the presence of God. And what he expresses in his desires could well be expressed in a prayer to God. And I think this is one of the reasons why he puts it this way, that Israel might take this up as a matter of urgent prayer. But these are intense longings. And it is an intense longing for the presence of God. Notice in verse 57, his repeated request and desire. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. This has been a mark of God all the way down. He has been with us and with our fathers. And then he puts it another way. May he not leave us. May he not forsake us. And the leaving and forsaking are words that are almost always in the Old Testament associated with Israel forsaking God and turning away from him as they did in the days of the wilderness, as they did in the days of the judges, and as they were to do subsequently, which led to them being exiled. But now Solomon is longing that God himself will presence himself with his people, and he will not leave them, he will not abandon them, he will not forsake them. You see, God's presence with his people 
is what makes God different to all the gods of the other nations. Because they're not real anyway. So they cannot be present with their people. They are just the figment of men and women's imaginations. But God is real. And his presence is real. The name of God, the Lord, Jehovah, I am who I am. The name by which he revealed himself to Moses. He is the God who is there. He is the God who is present to deliver his people from Egypt. It is by his mighty hand that they are delivered, isn't it? He is present with his people in power. The Lord, he is God with his people. That marks him out. Solomon believed that. He understood that. He had been well taught. He had imbibed the truth. He knew that the Lord was committed to his people in faithfulness. He was standing solid with them in their suffering when they were in Egypt. He redeemed them. He would be with them. This is what he promised to Moses. And Solomon knew this in Exodus chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12 when God appeared in the burning bush to Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses said to God, verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt? And so he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. I will be with you. I will certainly be with you. And before that, and we're thinking of Moses now, we're thinking of Abraham. These are the fathers. He says, as he was with the fathers. Well, what did he say to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7? I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. He was saying he would not leave Abraham. He would not forsake Abraham. He would be present with Abraham and with his descendants. He was the God of his people. Moses and Abraham are the fathers. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers, with Abraham, with Moses. He is deeply aware that this then is the reason, God's presence is the reason why Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were blessed. This is the reason why God has blessed Israel, why he redeemed them. This is what marked Israel out as a distinctive people. God was real. God was there. God was present with them. And that is why in verse 58, you have the second part of this intense longing, expressed as a longing for obedience. And it's expressed in terms of a purpose, the end to which he says, be present with us, that he, this God who is present with us, that he may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. There it is again, you see. He wants this constancy, he wants this continuity, of the presence of God and the faithfulness of God's people. Incline our hearts to yourself. If he was putting into prayer, that is what he would be saying. Lord, make us walk in all your ways. But he's expressing it now before the people and saying, may this be the case. He wants to, he has been impressed with this and the significance of this and he's impressing this and he's blessing the people and showing them the way forward in order that those longings may be their longings. He desires the presence of God to the end that God may bless his people and his people will keep his commandments. If we look back again you know, so much of this prayer depends upon what has gone before. If we turn back to Deuteronomy and chapter 7, 
There in verse 6, Moses reminds the people, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And then notice what he says. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with them who hate him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes, the judgments, which I command you today to observe them. Notice he goes on, verse 12, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you, keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers, and he will love you and bless you and multiply you. And then he goes on to detail some of these blessings that follow from obedience. These are the things that Solomon desires now for this nation, now they have come and been settled in the land, now the temple has been built. But he is taking up these thoughts from Deuteronomy, from the days of the fathers, and he is spelling them out. He desires the blessing of God. He desires that the people will continue to experience the presence of God, the love of God, the blessing of God, the covenant faithfulness of God, that Israel will remain a true nation, true to the God who has redeemed them. They are no longer in Egypt. They're no longer in the wilderness. They're no longer fighting with their enemies. God has given them rest through David, and now Solomon, whose name, remember, means peace. They are rested in the promised land. The temple has been built. Peace is on every side. Chapter 4 and verses 24 and 25 of 1 Kings. Remember, Israel and Judah now dwell safely. Every man under his vine and fig tree. A picture of the blessing of God. Solomon's intense desire is that that blessing will continue. The presence of God and the obedience of the people. The faithfulness of the people to the covenant. And the covenant God who has redeemed them. See then, Solomon's intense longing. He does not want to see the judgments and the curses of God come upon this people. The height of blessing is to have God with them and for them to obey God and to enjoy the fullness of that blessing. Therefore his cry is, May the Lord our God be with us. May he incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways. When you step back and think about it for a moment, Solomon's heart, his longings, his desires, they are beating in time with the heart of God. He wants the will of God to be done. He is jealous, he is zealous for the honour and glory of his God. What he longs to see is the fulfilling of God's redemptive purposes in his people. You will see it again expressed in verse 59. May he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. 
You see where this man is going. You see then why he has these intense longings and desires. It's not the greatness of Solomon. It's not the greatness even of the nation that is his primary concern. It is the greatness of God and the name and honour and glory of God in all the earth. That's why he has redeemed this people. That's why he longs for the presence of God. That's why he longs to see the people obeying and loving the Lord their God. For as long as they do so, he will not leave them. He will not forsake them. So long as they do not turn away to idolatry and false worship, Solomon knows that the blessing of God will remain upon this people. God with us. God with us. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Emmanuel. Jesus. God with us. How precious is that thought. And how we long, I trust, for that ultimate fulfilment of God with us. It is recorded there in Revelation chapter 21. The dwelling of God is with man. That's the final, ultimate blessing. That, there in the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the dwelling of God again with his people, in all the fullness and all the realisation of what that means. In the meantime, we wait for that day to be fulfilled. In the meantime, God dwells here with his people, in his temple in Solomon's day. And he dwells with us supremely, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He came. He lived upon this earth. He tabernacled amongst us. He took our flesh. He is Emmanuel. God with us. And now, we who are the church of Jesus Christ, we are God's people. We are his temple. And by his spirit, he dwells in us. And with us. God is with us. And that is the choicest, the best, of the blessings that God bestows upon his people. God is our God. God is present with us through his Son, by his Holy Spirit. And he is present with us in a fuller way than he was in the days of Solomon, because more of God has been revealed now in the person of Jesus Christ. And by the power of the Spirit of God. We haven't time to dwell upon these things at any greater length. But I simply want to, do not want to leave anybody with the impression that God is no longer present with us. Simply because we do not see visibly some cloud of glory. No, God is indeed with his people. This is what marks us out. This is why we are who we are. If God were not present with us, we would not exist. No, he is present. And it is a wonderful thing to know his presence and to know that he is our God and that we are his people. But we must ask ourselves a question and provide the answer now to the question. Why? Why does Solomon long in this particular way? Why does he express himself in this particular way, in verses 57 and 58. Here is something I would suggest to you is interesting and significant. Notice the order of Solomon's intense desire in verses 57 and 58. He first of all says, May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. First of all, he expresses that desire for God's presence. And then he says, may he incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways. Turn back two or three chapters in your Bibles to 1 Kings 6 and verses 12 and 13. When Solomon began to build the temple, the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning the temple that you are building. What do you notice in verses 12 and 13? Let's read them. Verse 11, the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this temple which you are building, 
If you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Now I haven't asked you a very difficult question, have I? Solomon has turned things around the other way. God said to him, if you do this, if you walk in my ways, then I will be present with you. Solomon, in blessing the people, and it could be said, it could be expressed as a prayer, it's his intense longing and desire, he prays, first of all, that God will be present, and that then God will incline the hearts of his people to walk in all his ways. Why has Solomon changed the order? Why does he express himself in that particular way? Why not say, Lord, we'll walk in all your ways, therefore be present with us. But he doesn't, does he? He's not forgotten the words that God spoke to him when he began to build that temple. He's sincere, I would suggest to you, he has deliberately taken note of those words. Because there's so much reflected in this blessing, here in verses 57 and 58 in 1 Kings 8. But why has he changed the order? I would suggest the following reason. Solomon is realistic. Solomon is honest. In his zeal and in his jealousy for God's blessing, he is not carried away by a false optimism. Most of his prayers, most of his petitions, expressed in the centre of this chapter 8, have been prefaced by when they sin against you, then <coughs> forgive, pardon, restore, and so on. For example, in verse 46, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them over to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy far or near. They've sinned against God. And Solomon is realistic. He's honest. He is well aware that there are not only blessings, but also there are curses for disobedience. They are living under the lordship of God. And God says, you walk in this way, and I will bless you. You turn against me, and I will bring the curses of my covenant upon you. They were there in Deuteronomy 28. They are there in Leviticus chapter 26. What is required of Israel now is that they respond in love and in obedience to God if they are to enjoy the presence of God. And so Solomon, well aware of his own sin, well aware of Israel's history in the wilderness and the judges, well aware of the sins of the people, he puts it in this way. And he pleads, as it were, as we turn it now into a prayer, he is pleading for the presence of God. But he's saying, Lord, if you're going to be present, then you are going to have to turn us and incline our hearts to walk in your ways. We have not got it in and of ourselves, the ability to do that. If we are left to ourselves, we will go astray and forfeit your presence. We can only enjoy your presence, Lord, if you incline us, if you turn us to walk in the ways of obedience. And I would suggest to you that that is perhaps the main reason why Solomon prays in this way, reversing the order of the revelation that God had given to him in 1 Kings 6. God there promised, if you walk in my ways, then I will dwell among you. But Solomon's desire and Solomon's prayer would be, Lord, dwell with us. Don't leave us. Don't forsake us. Incline your heart, our hearts to walk in your ways. Lord, we're dependent upon you. And he wants to impress that upon the hearts and minds and consciences of the nation of Israel. He wants to cast himself and to cast the people on God. It's a confession of sin. It's a confession of weakness. 
It's a confession of inability. It's a confession of dependence upon God. What impressions should this make upon us? These intense longings. What mark should they leave upon us? This is Holy Scripture. This is the Word of God. The Word of God is able to make us wise unto salvation. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And a passage like this, like any other passage, ought to leave a permanent mark and impression upon us. Well, how will it make us wise unto salvation? Well, it tells us the principles that I here tell us. That however much we may desire the presence of God, however much we may intend to walk in the ways of God and to love and obey God, there is no way that we are in control of those things. There is no way in which we can save ourselves. There is no way in which we can secure the blessing of God. There is no way in which we can compel God to say, I will be your God. You will be my people. It is down to God's initiative. It is down to God's sovereign will and purpose. It begins with God's love. It begins with God choosing Israel. It begins with God saying, I will be your God. And I will make you my people. And if you have any intention of serving God, you must realize that that intention itself must be God-given. Going right back to very basics. You and I cannot save ourselves. We cannot turn our hearts to walk in the ways of God. There are thousands today who think that they enjoy something of the presence of God. What are they relying upon? Nice warm feelings that they have. Religious thoughts and sentiments. Attending church, listening to sermons, singing hymns, saying prayers. These are not the things that guarantee the promise, the presence of God. Where is the love? Where is the obedience in our hearts to God? Where does that come from? You cannot conjure that up. A thousand sermons just listened to will not produce love and obedience. A thousand hymns sung with great gusto will not pro produce that love and obedience. It is the work of the Spirit of God to transform our hearts. We cannot enjoy God's blessing. We cannot enjoy God's presence. We cannot begin to love and obey God apart from a new heart given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit of God. And it is through Jesus Christ alone that this blessing comes. You have to first of all realize you have nothing to offer. You're empty. You're empty. And only God only God can fill you. Only God can change you. Only God, taking the initiative as he does in his mercy, coming to us in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, can change our hearts and guarantee the blessing, the presence of God and that obedience that comes and that love which comes as a result of the Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts. Eternal life, says our Lord Jesus Christ, is to know the Father and the one whom the Father has sent into the world. And eternal life is God's gift in his Son, Jesus Christ. And it's received by faith in Christ. That's the supreme blessing. To know the presence of God. To have eternal life in his Son, Jesus Christ. It's all dependent upon the grace of God. But how can a passage like this instruct us in righteousness? 
Give us the right attitude, the right desires, these inward desires, these longings. Let me now speak to those who you who profess to be God's people. Let me remind you, you are God's dwelling place, the dwelling place of his spirit. Would you enjoy this blessing, the blessing of God's presence? Well, let me ask you. These longings of Solomon, do you have an increasing longing for those same things as Solomon. For God's blessing upon you, upon your family, upon this church, upon the church of Jesus Christ, a longing and a desire for the presence of God and for that love and obedience, a heart to walk in all his ways, loving him, Obeying him. You see, we're very easy for us to say, well, yes, we want to know the presence of God, but God has joined his presence with the love and obedience of his people. You say, well, maybe that's an Old Testament thing. No, it isn't. Let me just give you one example. In John chapter 14 and verse 23. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ said. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And you see that that is very similar to what Solomon is saying? God will come and dwell with his people. Who are his people? His people are those who love him, who love his word, who love the word of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, if you are my disciples, if you love me, we will come. We will come and dwell. I will come. My Father will come. The Spirit will come. It is foolish, it is short-sighted of us to dream of enjoying the presence of God regardless of the way in which we walk before God. God has married together his presence and obedience and love to him and to his son, Jesus Christ. Surely, then, if that is the case, I hope you are persuaded in your mind and your conscience, if that is the case, then surely one of your constant prayers and one of the constant prayers of the people of God, the Christian church in every generation, must surely be, in the light of a realistic, sober self-assessment of our own remaining sin, Lord, incline our hearts to yourself to walk in all your ways. If we're not praying in that way, there is a danger we'll be pulled if we are not already being pulled in another direction. Casual indifference. Carelessness. Keeping up an outward appearance while inwardly we are declining. Think of the seven churches that John wrote to in Asia Minor. Some of them were declining. They had the outward form but their hearts we're drifting. You've lost your first love, said Christ to one of the churches. He called upon others to repent because of their toleration of false doctrine and false practice and false prophets and false teachers. Is that any different from what Israel did? <coughs> you see, it's a decline. It's a drifting away from love to God, from love to Christ. That's why it is so important. That's why I would underline that it must surely be the constant prayer of each individual and each Christian church. Lord, incline our hearts to yourself to walk in all your ways. Such intense longings, my brothers and sisters in Christ, lie at the very root of godliness and true holiness. That is how our hearts should beat 
Those intense longings of Solomon for God's presence, for God's blessing, must be married to a love for and an obedience to the commandments of God, of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, what will happen? The same thing will happen to us as happened to Israel of old. We will cease to be the distinctive people of God. We will cease to be Christ's witnesses in this world. And you'll scarcely be able to tell the difference between us and the rest of the human race. You may find that very hard to believe. But let's be honest. Let's be realistic. That's why Solomon prayed, I believe, the way that he did. That's why he expressed his desires, his longings in the way that he did. He was honest. He was realistic. We say, very well, but how do we do that? How do we maintain this jealous desire an intense desire for the presence of God and the blessing of God and for this love and this obedience to God. Well, go back. Go back to your salvation. Go back to the grace of God. God has set his love upon you in his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what Solomon did. He mentions the fathers. He goes back to the fathers. He goes back to redemption. He goes back to God's sovereign electing love. God choosing Israel from all the nations of the world as his own special people. And redeeming them out of the land of Egypt. And entering into a covenant with them and swearing, I will be your God and you will be my people. And in Jesus Christ, we have our salvation. We need to go back and realise The wonder of what God has done in redeeming us and setting us in Jesus Christ. Joining us to Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Taking us out of the kingdom of darkness. Putting us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So that our destiny is no longer hell. But our destiny is heaven and Christ and God in all his dwelling presence among his people. And as you begin to realise that God has set his love upon you and you didn't deserve any of it, then you begin to realise the end for which you have been redeemed. Israel was redeemed by God and set apart unto God. You have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and set apart to Christ to serve him, to love him, to obey him. Is it any great burden and hardship to love the Lord Jesus Christ when he has done so much for you and laid down his life for you? John asked that question. Are the the commandments of God, the commandments of God, are they burdensome? Are they a drag? A burden to you? A weight that you can't bear? How much then, he says, do you not understand the love that God has displayed towards you in Christ. You see, it's an awareness of God who takes the initiative in our salvation, what God has done. It's that which stirs up within us, that desire for his presence, for his blessing, and that willingness and that desire, crying out unto him in our conscious weakness, Lord, incline our hearts to yourself to walk in all your ways. Go back to God's promises. I will be your God. You will be my people. Plead with the Lord. Lord, don't forsake us. Lord, don't abandon us. Don't leave us. Make us and keep us as your people. Incline your heart, our hearts. Turn us in the ways of truth, righteousness, holiness, We may walk in those ways and delight ourselves in you and in your word and in your commandments. How can you maintain that? The same way that you maintain that awareness of the promises of God, you immerse yourself in the word of God. And you immerse yourself, I suggested, in the promises of God, you immerse yourself in the precepts of God. Not the promises over against the precepts, not the precepts over against the promises, but you immerse yourself in God's promises and God's 
precepts. God's commandments. They are both words from God. It's those promises and these precepts that left their mark on Solomon. On Solomon's mind, on Solomon's conscience. It worked its way into his feelings, into his emotions, into his desires, into his longings, and expressed themselves in his prayers on that day of the dedication of the temple. That's what made him the man of God that he was on that occasion. And that is what will make you men and women of God in this generation. My prayer is that we will continue to know and know in increasing measure the presence and the blessing of God. But it can only be as we love him, as we obey his commands. Therefore I urge you to pray, to pray with me and to make it your constant prayer. Incline our hearts to yourself to walk in all your ways, to keep your commands, to keep your statutes, to keep your judgments. Will God not honour his own word? He has promised, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. May we know those things in the days to come. Amen. O oh Lord, our God, how much we desire your presence, your blessing. You have promised I will be your God, you will be my people. The Lord Jesus Christ has said that he would come and dwell with his people, that the Father would come and dwell with us. And to that end we pray, O oh God, incline our hearts unto yourself. Incline our hearts to walk in all your ways. Lord, let us not forsake you. Let us not turn away from you. And therefore we plead with you, Lord, do not leave us. Do not forsake us. We cast ourselves once again upon you. And pray that you would strengthen us and sanctify us and cause our hearts to delight in you all the days of our life and then in heaven hereafter when we see Jesus Christ in all his beauty and all his perfection and all our intense longings and desires are fulfilled in the new Jerusalem. Lord, we ask these things for the sake of our Saviour Jesus Christ who has loved us and given himself for us. Amen. Amen.